and happy Father's Day to all the fathers and to those of you who act like fathers in the congregation. So let's all say, Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Welcome to all. Um, I want to give a special thank you to um, Sue Rowe today for being our liturgist and also to Natalie who's been doing like triple duty. I said, I don't know. <laughs> She's filling in for Kay today who is on vacation. So we give Natalie a big thanks and also on her birthday for pulling together the pork, pulled pork dinner. So there you go. Please make sure, does everyone have a bulletin and a purple hymn book? I think you guys are all used to that now, but just to make sure. You got all of those things. Um, birthdays. I forgot to re-look at my list here, so let's take a look. Oh my, Cheryl Lotz's birthday is today, but she's not here yet, so if she walks in, we'll sing. But, um, and Sue Klein's birthday is this week, Kaylin Norton's is this week, Emily Lang's is this week, and Ron Lehman's is this week. So there's lots of birthdays, lots of June <laughs> birthdays. Oh, Steve's grandson, Nico's birthday was yesterday. He turned five. He's very proud of that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, the Children's Book Garden. I wanted to thank all of the volunteers who did that this week. I heard that it went really well. In fact, most of the coloring books were given away. So we have 15 left. Um, we have a couple of weeks to restock, but if you would be so inclined to look for some coloring books when you're out, and we will continue that ministry. We have four more times that we're doing it this summer. Um, and I guess Scott has a few stories from Thursday night. I don't know where he disappeared to, but um, if you catch up with him, he may tell you a few good things. Um, but I think in general it went well, right? So everybody was pretty pleased. I also want to thank um, Natalie and all of the volunteers who put or pulled together the pulled pork fundraiser. No pun intended there, but um, how did the drive-through go, go, Natalie? Did you like that? People like the drive-through. Okay, so see ideas and take what works, and we'll continue. This week, Wednesday, we have the Bible study that Christine is doing on Wednesday. We also have session on Wednesday, so just a reminder of those two things. And the office is going to be closed on Thursday and on Friday. I will be working from home on Friday. Um, Steve is flying out to Maine to get to see his um, daughter. He hasn't seen her since before COVID, so I think it's time to get out and see one of his three daughters, so he is flying out, and that means I'm on duty at home, so I need to be home on Friday. So <laughs> if you need anything, um, leave a message, and I, may, I can't access the church phone, unfortunately, until I get back in, but I will make sure on Sunday I respond to any messages. Um, so anyways, hopefully everything will go fairly well there. Strawberry Social is next Saturday, and Bill has been selling tickets, and he's in the back, and he's downstairs, so we're trying to get a group together for that, so if you um, will see Bill, that's at 1 o'clock. They're hoping to gather a whole bunch together for fellowship um, next Saturday over at the historical, it's called Historical Museum, right, Bill? Okay. And in the future, we have Music on the Lake, um, the Lakeside Sound on Friday. June 30th. The Pilots game Sunday, July 23rd that we're aiming for as a fellowship activity. I'm doing summer Bible studies and I did put the sign up list downstairs and I have books in the office. So if anybody's interested in that, that starts July 12th and I'm offering two different times on Wednesdays for that. And we'll be weaving that into our services on Sunday mornings. So you'll hear a little of that. Is there anything I Oh, Natalie, you want to make an announcement about the... We have a few tickets left for the whole dinner called the Wednesday Night Holiday, and Christine will be down there at the club on the Old Brown. That's our first call. Hopefully it's by then. If you want to join us. <laughs> yes, Sue? I forgot to mention something. The call to care group in Canandaigua at the PW has agreed to work with them when they sponsor a refugee family that's coming in from uh, uh, Haiti, Guatemala, Syria, Ukraine, wherever they might be coming from. So PW's part in this mission is to provide uh, household goods that might be necessary for each 
family as they come in. I understand that we are, they are expecting a new family in the next 10 days. So look for an email from me that will have specifics as to exactly what they need, whether it's towels or sheets or clothes or dishes or whatever it might be for the household. Um, just look for uh, SRO 918 um, and I'll have that list. And if you can let me know what item you'd like to contribute to the, to the cause, that way we won't have any duplications. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? If not, this is our time to worship our most glorious Lord and to worship together. So I started something last week. I had to actually look at each other before the church service and greet each other. So would you turn to one another and extend a greeting right now before we begin? So. Relaxes the tension a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we are here together to worship our most glorious Lord, so let us join together as God's people. Natalie? Hallelujah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Join me in the call to worship. Welcome together in the sure knowledge God does not pass us by. We gather to worship knowing this truth. God fulfills promises. Even when we cannot muster belief, God is faithful to us. Join me in this prayer. God of all power and peace, as Jesus sent his disciples out to heal the sick, cast our demons, gather the lost, raise the dead, and proclaim the nearness of your realm, make us ready to go and share the good news we have received. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. 
Join us now for the hymn, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine, page 837. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand. So with confidence in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Would you pray the prayer of confession with me? God of our salvation, incline your ear to us. You have given us power, power to heal, to bring hope, to comfort, to restore but we ignore that power, choosing to live our own lives. At worst, we abuse that power, storing up riches for ourselves without an eye for the needs of others. Forgive us and remind us of our call to proclaim your good news and to welcome each other as we would welcome you. And let us all say, Amen. The ancient words still bring truth today. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Praise be to God for this abounding love. God has received us, pardoned us, and loved us. So let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. Peace be with all of you. Would you turn to one another and extend signs of peace to one another as God's people? As you are able, let's stand and sing glory to God.
The prayer of illumination. God of redemption, summon us to Sarah's joy, Abraham's wonder, and Paul's confident hope through the word and work of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, is in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Genesis, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7, and it's the birth of Isaac. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The second scripture reading is from Matthew, chapters 9, 35 through chapter 10, verse 8. And this is the harvest is great, the laborers are few. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The next section is the 12 apostles. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of of Ephesus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. The mission of the 12. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not take a road leading to the Gentiles, and do not enter a Sumerian town, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with a skin disease, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. That is the word of the Lord.
She's all dressed up today. How's Maybe doing? Are you taking good care of her? Yeah. Come on, right over here where you can see. This book is a special book, Aaliyah, because it's called You Are Special. Do you like it when somebody says you are special? Yeah. Yeah. Are there some times, though, when maybe you feel like you're not quite so special? I know you feel special today because you've got a dress on, right? Yeah. Sometimes there's some days we just don't feel very special, right? But then there are other days when we feel really, really good about ourselves. You've had those days already? Yeah. Yeah, some days. Well, this is a special story that was written, and I'm going to read just part of it to you, but we're going to kind of... There's some funny-looking people. Do you see them? Yeah. Some of them have what on them? Stars. Oh, some have stars, and some have... Um, some pennies. Yeah, it looks like pennies. They're dots. So some people have stars, and some have... Dots. dots. Now, what looks better? Do the stars look better, or do the dots look better? Oh, uh, yeah. What do you think, congregation? Stars? Yeah. Dots aren't quite so, you know, especially if they're not special. They're just gray dots. Like you said, they look like coins, right? Okay. Well, there was a town called that had all these people in it, the Wemix. They were small wooden people. And all of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. And his workshop sat on a high hill overlooking their village. Each Wemick was different. Look out at the congregation. Are we all different? Everybody looks different, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're all different. Some had big noses, sorry. Others had large eyes. Some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats and others wore coats. But all were made by the same carver, and they all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemix did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Hmm. How would you like going around giving stickers all the time? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like me, but... <laughs> Each Wemix had a box of golden star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Now, right there, there's a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah, which is going to be the better? What do you think, the golden or the gray? Yeah, I agree. I think the golden one. So up and down the streets all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. Hmm. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemix gave dots. Uh-oh. Not too good, right? <gasps> The talented ones got stars. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads, and still others knew big words, and everyone gave them stars. Some we we mix had stars all over them, and every time they got a star, it made them feel really good. But others, though, could do little. They got gray. They got the gray dots. You are right. Oh no. So now comes our main character. See him over here? Mm -hmm. His name is Punchinello, was one of these. He tried everything. He tried to jump high, and he did all these different things, but you know what? Every time he did something, his wood got scratched, so what'd they give him? Um, dots. They gave him dots. He couldn't do anything. He had so many dots all over him, so, so many, it was terrible. And the people just said he deserves lots of dots. He's not a good wooden person. Hmm. Is that their right to decide that? No. No, I don't think so either. Look how sad he looks. Hmm. One day he met a Wemic who was unlike any he'd never met. She had no dots or stars. Look. No dots or stars? Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Hmm. Some of the Wemix admired Lucia for having no dots, so they'd run up and give her a star. It'd just fall off. Oh, well. 
That's the way I want to be, thought Puccinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the Weemick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go to see Eli. Eli? You remember who Eli was? What did Eli do? Uh, I draw the pictures. Oh, actually, yes, he's the one who created all the people, right? Made them? Yeah, you're right. Okay. So in some ways, Eli's kind of like who? Uh, I don't know. Who created all of us? Uh, Eli. Oh, I don't think Eli did. Who created us, though? Jesus. That's right. Okay. God did, right? Very good. Oh, so anyways, yes, Eli the woodcarver. Well, why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. So Puccinello went up, okay? He went home, he sat near the window, he watched the wooden people, and he finally decided that he was gonna go see Eli. So, he walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill, and he stepped into the big shop, and his wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench, a hammer as long as his arm. Puccinello swallowed very hard. But then he heard his name. He decided he was a little scared. He wasn't going to stay. But then he heard his name. The voice was deep and strong. Puccinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Well, Puccinello turned slowly and looked at Eli. You know my name. Of course I do. I made you. And Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at all those gray dots. <laughs> Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me. I don't care what the other Weemix think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? Wow. I think Eli's on the right track, don't you? Yeah. And then he told Puccinello that he was special. <laughs> Puccinello just laughed. He said, what's special about me? And Eli looked at Puccinello and put his hands on those small wooden shoulders and spoke very slowly. He said, because you're mine. Aaliyah, did you know that you are God's child? Yeah, you belong to God, and God loves you just the way you are, just the way Eli loved Puccinello. Well, Puccinello didn't know what to say. So there's more talking that went on. But Eli explained that the stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. So guess what? Eli smiled. He said, you've got a lot of marks. From now on, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. So Eli lifted Puccinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Puccinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And you know what happened? It came off. The sticker fell off one of them. So the more he believed that God loved him, the more stickers, the more those dots fell off. So that's what we have to remember. We are special to God no matter what because God made us, okay? Let's have a repeat after me prayer. Can you help us, congregation, please? Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us just the way we are. Help us to love others just the way they are. Amen. Okay. Do you want to take the book back and take a look at it? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Be careful going down the stairs, especially in that long dress.
delegated empowerment. Matthew 9, 35, or sorry, Matthew actually 10, 1 says, Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority. The Gospel of Matthew says that Jesus gave authority to his disciples. Well, that Greek word that's translated authority is actually exousia. It comes from exousia, which means delegated empowerment. So what do those words delegated empowerment mean? Well, to delegate means to entrust to another or to appoint as one's representative. To empower means to give someone official authority or freedom to do something. In an online article called Delegation and Empowerment, Recognizing the Benefits and Overcoming the Barriers, author Diana Holland writes, definitions matter. We often use delegate and empower interchangeably. And while they overlap in some ways, they aren't the same. And they might mean different things to different people. Diana continues, both terms communicate that idea of relinquishing or decentralizing control of tasks, missions, roles, responsibilities, and functions. To delegate is to deliberately assign a defined task, mission, or function to a specific person or entity, normally a direct report or subordinate. To empower is a broader term that conveys giving or allowing others the freedom to act with little or any prompting, direction, or supervision. It also includes providing additional tools to enhance a person's capabilities, unquote. So what task did Jesus delegate, and how did Jesus empower his disciples, and to what end? I just started reading a book called Servant Leadership, and in the book, Robert Greenleaf relays the story of Leo, the lead character in a fictional book by Herman Hesse called Journey to the East. In this story, there's a band of men on a mythical journey. Leo is their servant. He does all of their menial chores, and he sustains them with his spirit and his song. He is said to be a person with an extraordinary presence. One day, Leo disappears and the group falls into disarray, and the journey is abandoned. And after some number of years, the narrator, who was one of the original band, finds Leo, and he discovers that Leo, known first as a servant, is in fact a great and noble leader. Greenleaf surmises that the story clearly says that the great leader is seen as servant first, and that simple fact is the key to his greatness. Leo was the leader all the time, but he was servant first because that's what he was deep down inside. Well, Jesus was a great leader and he was servant first. How do we know this? Our gospel reading starts out by saying that Jesus went, Jesus taught, Jesus healed, Jesus also had compassion. Who did he have compassion for? It was the common people. That is what that Greek word translated crowds means, aklos, or the common people. Not only that, but the gospel writer says that Jesus had compassion for these common folk. The Greek word translated compassion means to be moved in your inward parts, literally your guts. This is what Greenleaf means by deep down inside. Jesus was deep down inside a servant first, and his motivation was one of being moved deep down inside in his inward parts. Well, Jesus told his disciples, not just the 12, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Well, Jesus talks of laborers. That Greek word translated laborers comes from the Greek word ergon, which means worker. But figuratively, it can also mean teacher. Jesus wanted to provide shepherds for the crowds, for the aquas. Matthew tells us that Jesus saw the crowds like the sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the aquas ripe for teaching, but Jesus also knew that the teachers were few. Jesus went and Jesus sent, but he didn't send until he had prepared until he had taught both by example and by work what it was the laborers or the teachers his disciples were to do. And he taught them to be effective servant leaders themselves. How else would they then be able to teach other servant leaders for the faith to be spread? In an online article called What is Servant Leadership? Robert Greenleaf says, A servant leader focuses primarily on the growth and the well-being of people and the communities to which they belong. While traditional leadership generally involves the accumulation and the exercise of power by the one at the top of the pyramid, servant leadership is different. The servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. I was very interested in Greenleaf's last sentence. The servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. Jesus gave authority to the disciples. He delegated empowerment. But it started by teaching them what it meant to be a servant leader. Jesus put servant leadership first. The disciples were to continue his tradition of teaching and healing. They too were to extend compassion to the common folk. They were to be moved from the inward parts, from deep down inside, to shepherd the people by helping them to develop and perform as highly as possible. Jesus was first and foremost a great servant leader. He helped his disciples develop and perform as highly as possible by both preparing and instructing them. Jesus shared his power by giving 12 of his disciples authority. Jesus also put the needs of others first by sending labors out. Jesus provided shepherds for the aklos, or the common folk. As Greenleaf said, a servant leader focuses primarily on the growth and the well-being of people and the communities to which they belong. Jesus taught his disciples to be servant leaders. How did Jesus then prepare his servant leaders? He did it by preparing and instructing them. He didn't just send them out in the cold. At this point, I noticed two other things in our reading. The gospel writer uses both the words disciple and apostle, and I thought it was very interesting, Sue, that you slipped on that when you went to say it. It says that Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority. After this, they were named as the 12 apostles. The words disciple and apostle mean two different things. In Greek, the word translated disciple is methetes. It means learner. Disciples are learners, both of doctrine and of lifestyle. And Jesus taught many more than the 12. But once he conferred authority on them, they were no longer just learners. The Greek word translated apostle is apostolos, and it means a messenger or one who is sent on a message or a mission. Apostolus comes from apostello, which means to commission someone. But the focus is on the authority of the sender. In other words, Jesus commissioned 12 of his disciples to carry out his work, that of a laborer 
or teacher, to be a servant leader, a shepherd. And what was their mission? The Gospel writer makes it very clear they were to do what Jesus did. They were to teach and to heal and to be shepherds for the aklos, for the common folk. I told you earlier that exousia means delegated empowerment. It is the authority that God gives to us, God's people. Thus, we too are authorized to act to the extent that we are guided by faith. We, like Jesus, are called to be servant leaders. We, like the first apostles, are given authority, delegated empowerment, and are called to be messengers. Like those first apostles, we are being sent out to be shepherds to the aquas. This may seem like an awesome task, but it isn't so different from being a parent. On Father's Day, I would be remiss not to mention how parents, moms and dads, and all who take on the responsibilities of parents are servant leaders. You don't try to lord it over your children. You put the needs of your family first. You seek to empower your own children and grandchildren to be all that they can be. Well, in much the same way, we are called by Jesus to be servant leaders, to use the gifts that we have been given to encourage the growth and the well-being of our church community and the community in which we minister, that of Newark, New York. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We may be few, but with Jesus' empowerment, we can make a difference. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the stories that you give us, the ways that you taught. We thank you for being a servant leader one who had compassion from deep down inside. May that same compassion stem from us. May the Holy Spirit give us the impetus and the push towards the newest of what you would have this church, Park Church, do here in Newark and beyond. May we have a feeling for the aklos, for all. And may we remember that we are empowered through Christ to be your messengers to the world around us, to our families, to our church, to our communities, to the world. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue to respond to God's word through the singing of the hymn, Standing on the Promises.
Let us continue to respond to God's word by affirming what we believe is taken from our affirmation of faith, or as we state our affirmation of faith is taken from the Confession of 1967. Together, Jesus Christ is God with humankind. He is the eternal Son of the Father who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to complete his mission. This work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. Are there any prayers online, Michael? None? Do we have any prayers from the congregation? None today? I would ask today, um, when you hear me say, incline your ear to us, if you would respond, hear our prayers and supplications. So let's practice that. Hear our prayers and supplications. Let us pray together as God's people. This is um, written by Stephanie Sorge, taken from Presbyterian Outlook. In sure and certain hope of God's faithfulness, let us come to God in prayer, praying, incline your ear to us, hear our prayers and supplications. We pray for a world that is still so far from God's good creation, we see the devastating evidence of our failure to care for the earth and everything in it. Wars rage and siblings take up arms against siblings. We pray especially for those who are most impacted by environmental devastation, war, and lack of basic resources. Incline your ear to us. Hear our prayers and supplications. On the eve of Juneteenth, we recognize that so many people still cry out for liberation. We operate in and perpetuate unjust systems built on the scaffolding of oppression of people based on skin color, nationality, ethnicity, religion, gender, and more. Freedom and emancipation have been proclaimed throughout the land, but many are still in bonds today. In a broken justice system, in the prison industrial complex, and in child labor and sex trafficking, trafficking that thrive under broken immigration policies and social support systems. Our lips cry out for justice, but the climb is steep and our comfort often gets in the way. Make your justice roll down like waters, we pray. Incline your ear to us. Hear our prayers and supplications. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, and for all who struggle with mental illness and addiction and the impacts of trauma. We pray for the lonely, the hurt, and the estranged. We pray for all who live in chronic sickness or pain. Give us compassion in our relationships and encounters with others who are fighting battles we don't know. Incline your ear to us. Hear our prayers and supplications. We pray for the church, the world, and the whole human family, adding the prayers and supplications of your people. We pray for Bethany Camella and Mark Booth, for Deb Comfer and Shannon, for Joe and Lori Hattendorf, for Kay Gray and Donald Merrill and Scott Blondell, 
for Kay Oosterling and Aaron and Dom, for James and Glenn and Todd and Richard, for William, Douglas and Christine, for Wanda Gallagher and Lisa Trimetti, for Shirley May and Sandy Root, for Becky Durr and David and Steve, for Linda Laurie and Barb and Alice Crespo, for Deanna Side and Janine Dutcher, for Caitlin Tracy and Kathy Brunessel, for Lisa Barrett's son and family, for David Wilk, for Bev Owen and Nancy Tarantelli, for Jean Salisbury and Jan Smith, for Allison Holloway and Allison's daughter and Tim, friend of Allison, for Evan Lang and John, friend of Emily Lang, and Doug McCrossan and Tom Brady, for Gil Burgess and Nancy Thayer, for Judy Leone, Ginny Bodine, Bodine, Shirley Kem, Josh McCrossan, and all Family Promise families. We pray for Kay and Dale Groover, for Thelma Vermeulen, for Barb Chapel and Bonnie and Thurlow Hammond, for Ed and Cheryl Lotz, for Barbara Bruner, for Eileen Berm, for Marion Maxwell, and Jim and Ann Peck. We pray for the grieving friends and family of Jerry Silowa and Barbara Diesering, and for Yao and Mark Simon on the loss of their unborn twins and Mark's brother. Incline your ear to us. Hear our prayers and supplications. Loving God, we offer these prayers to you, including those that remain on our hearts and those known only to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to respond through our offering. Jesus gathered the disciples and gave them authority to heal the sick, to cast out evil, and to proclaim the good news. So let us present our offerings for the mission of the church, bearing witness to the kingdom of God. If you would stand as you are able as we sing Give Thanks. Good and holy God, for your steadfast love and faithfulness, we give you thanks and bless your name. Let our whole lives become songs of gratitude, joy, and praise, so that all the earth may know that we are your people and you are our God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is Fight the Good Fight, 846.
And now do not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God, but be strengthened by God's faith and give glory to God, being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what God promises every day. If Abraham can have a son at 100, we can do anything, okay? And now may God our Father bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. May Christ bless you so that you can be healers of a world that is hurting. And may the Holy Spirit bless you so that you can spread the hope that only the triune God can inspire and give to this world. And let us all say, Amen. Amen.